good. It's good. It's good to be here. It's good to see my entire family. My goodness. It's good when you guys come. I thought, oh, the church is packed today. Amen. We, amen. But uh, um, it's good to see my family. Of course, it's good to see my church family. And of course, uh, my mom in love here, uh, Mama Althea, who usually is watching us from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, with our brother Douglas, but you're here live today, so uh, good to have you here as well. Uh, a couple of things. I just want to give some love uh, to all of you who serve on our Sunday morning serve teams. Can we just give a round of applause? In fact, you may not be serving today, but if you have been serving, you deserve a round of applause. And for all those that are out there and in here, they deserve a round of applause. Um, we... And, you know, what was really unique is because the team that you serve, that you see serving today actually had to show up at 6.45 a.m. this morning uh, to clean this room, to vacuum it, to get it ready, and to get it tidy and nice. Uh, uh, um, and some of you might, what, what happened to the Crown Plaza? I'll tell you about that later, too. So uh, uh, we love the Crown Plaza. Amen. What a blessing they are. But... Um, I'm just so grateful. And it's funny because they all showed up. And then as a res there, was, there was nothing, they set everything up. So it didn't, they didn't even have to be here. And so nonetheless, big love, big shout out to uh, all of you who serve on serve teams. I think I say this frequently, worship doesn't start when the music plays. That's a real uh, shallow understanding of worship. It's not the lyrics or the songs that we sing. Worship started at 5 a.m. when all these guys woke up this morning to serve in the body of Christ. Really, that's what worship is. Okay, anyway, so thank you. Much, much love to you all. We are starting a new sermon series. So we're moving from the inspired church where we really took a deep dive into the scriptures. And really from that, we kind of practically began to define what the church of Jesus Christ looks like. And we are moving to a new series that we are calling The Beautiful Community, which is really just a spinoff of the Inspired Church as the Inspired Church is kind of theologically high and we're kind of understanding the church from the scriptures. Uh, um, the Beautiful Community is just how that church moves and interacts with one another. And so I actually want to challenge you uh, this week, for those of you that are belonging to Inspire Church, and even if you're here just visiting, um, I want to challenge you that as we go through this series in the next several weeks, that you would maybe make a commitment to do, I don't even think this is grammatically correct, do nothing alone. Make a commitment to do everything together. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean that if, if you go out to eat after church, invite somebody with you. Don't do it alone. Uh, if, if you read, read together. If you podcast and have a podcast, podcast together. If you do a daily devotion, do it with somebody together. Start a book club, pray together, fast together. I know the staff and I, for the last month, we have been going through the Psalms together. And it has been so edifying to my soul not to do it alone, but to do it together. And that during this month, as we talk about the beautiful community that Christ has made, I want to challenge you in your place and space to not do anything alone, but to do everything together. Pray this week together, this month, fast this month. I know I have a really close friend of mine. We are fasting every week together. And really one of my favorite times is when we break the fast, we'll actually call each other and for five minutes just pray and then head back to our days. And so... If the Lord just weighs it on your heart, maybe you should invite some people and do this together because that's what the church of Jesus Christ is. The beautiful community of God, worshiping, growing, giving, serving, maturing, connecting together as a family of believers. Amen. Amen. I told this story. If you were driving down Mission Boulevard on Thursday at about 3.30, you saw both a tragedy and a comedy simultaneously. Have you ever seen something so sad it was almost funny? Um, okay, nobody has. I have, maybe I'm just a real sick person, but um, I was on my bike, all 6'2", 220 pounds of myself, riding, thanks, 
riding down a very narrow sidewalk when I decided to tell my wife I was on my way home. And I pulled out my phone and at that point started to jerk the handlebars around and lost control. And the handlebar turned into my side and this big ogre-like thing flips over the handlebars, somersaulting, eating pavement, kind of going for a slide, and everybody's at the red light stop just like, I mean, if somebody had that on camera, no doubt it is probably trending at some point, but it was really just a tragedy and a comedy, and I thank God that nothing is broken, nothing, I have shalom, nothing missing, nothing lacking in my life, and, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, God is good. He has saved me from many toil. And um, yeah, anyways, amen. Maybe you had that kind of a week. <laughs> Maybe you came in here today having that kind of a week. I see Pastor Roger turning that AC on as I have both a sweater and a jacket. You are beautiful. And even like maybe a little napkin right here because I might just end up sweating. Uh, um, again, this, this wardrobe malfunction is killing me. But nonetheless, maybe you came in here today and maybe you didn't get into a physical accident, but maybe your week has felt that bad, maybe worse. And so I just pray today that you would be inspired in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have you ever had to force a friendship? Maybe not force a friendship. That sounds like those two words don't work. They really don't. But have you ever found yourself in a situation where you had to build a relationship out of thin air? Let me, let me, let me explain to you a, 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 a story. My beautiful wife, when we were dating, this was before we were married. How many of you know when you're dating, you are doing your best to put on your best face and you are doing all the things that you need to do. If you're married, this would be a whole different story. But this happened while we were dating. She thought it would be a great idea to go and see one of her close friends together. And her close friend was also bringing her husband. <laughs> Somebody knows where I'm going. Somebody knows where I'm going with this already. And you've heard this story before because I may have told it and other people have experienced it and all the men in the room, no doubt you are going to if you're married and maybe if you're dating someone, you might've felt this, but. So we show up to have lunch and right out the gate, I could just tell this guy and I, we got nothing in common, like nothing. I mean, I got a 49ers beanie, he's got a, a Pac-Man sweater, right? There's just, there's just, I could just tell no connection. Nothing against Pac-Man sweaters, 49er beanies. I mean, those are all great and beautiful things, but I could just tell Pastor Roger, you are, look, we got a 40 ounce and thank you. I appreciate that. Cold. <laughs> But you could just tell we got nothing in common. And I, I'm going to be honest. It's not like, oh, Phil's this type of guy. Like, you could tell he looked at me too like, no, I ain't got nothing in common that guy. Right? I mean, who wears a beanie and it's like 100 degrees, right? So, so it's, it goes both ways. And, you know, we were at lunch and we might have exchanged three words. But it was okay. Right? We had our wives with us. Right? Amen? Like, thank God we had our wives, or significant others, and they're, you know, the chatty Cathy's, and they're just, and we're just having a great time. But we, again, we might have made eye contact a few times, but we definitely said less words. Are you with me? Until, all of a sudden, our wives got a really great idea. And they're like, you know what? How about we go off? and go shopping and leave the boys, you know, together so that these guys can hang out, right? And it was like the most awkward and worst, like you can even see it on the guy's eye as well, like, no, babe. Like, and, and now I know, but I could, you know, when you're married, you have signs now, you know, you're older, you know, you kick under the table or you have a code word or maybe you say some things or whatever, but you got that eye contact, like that would have happened, but we were dating, we were dating. So yeah, yeah, babe, good idea. And you're, great, great idea. I'm with it. You know, I'm going to create a relationship with this guy of thin air. <laughs> and so they went and we spent the most awkward hour and a half together of my life. And if it wasn't for the toy section in Target, which has saved many of men, uh, or even the sample video games, I'm going to tell you what, like uh, we would probably have still remained. In fact, I feel like I'm still traumatized a little bit to this day. I mean, honestly, like there are, do you ever avoid awkward situations? Anybody ever do that? Like, can I just make a suggestion? The bathroom is the best place to go. 
Like it is like proven socially that those of us that don't like socially awkward situations, excusing yourself to the bathroom is the best thing because everyone knows like it's okay for someone to go to the bathroom. Like that is a good reason for you to leave and nobody follows you in there, right? Nobody keeps talking to you while you're going to the bathroom. There are times where I've been in the bathroom and I'm in there and I realize, what am I doing in here? Like, I'm not going, I'm not washing my hands, right? Like, or I'm just kind of running. And then you realize, oh, I am running from awkward situations. Now, some, thank you, thank you, because this morning I felt like I was the weirdest guy in the world because nobody, it was like, oh, really? Let's pray for Pastor Phil. But I feel like God, more people in this room feel me a little bit, right? But, but it was just kind of to put all this together, uh, uh, it got me thinking a little bit, like, what makes a good relationship? Like, what makes for good relationship? Like, what do you look for in friends? Um, what qualities do we look for in, in a good community, right? A good community. I mean, is it the friends that we make? Is it the memories that we create? Is it the interests that we share? And I think to all those questions, yes, absolutely. Like that's what makes for a really good friendship. That's what makes for great, good community. Now I want you to listen to this. Good community is based on a common bond. But... The beautiful community that Jesus Christ has made in the church is based on a common blood. Friendship is what you and I have in common. Fellowship is what you and I have in common in Christ. And we can have nothing in common in this world. But if we have the blood of Jesus in common, then the intimacy that I share with you is even greater than that. What a common interest. I know we don't believe that, though. But it's true. It's true. And so I'm entitling the message this morning, Bonded by His Blood bonded by his blood and as we travel the next six weeks seven weeks together to talk about this beautiful community i want to talk about the blood that was shed to bring us together that unites us in such a beautiful way can we pray yeah. let's pray heavenly father thank you so much for your word thank you so much for your people I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate this text. There are different people with different experiences, different backgrounds, different ethnicities in this place. And so take my words, Holy Spirit, and illuminate to every heart in this room so that we would all walk out of here with something life-giving. And so I just pray that you would be with me, you would be with us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I have to admit before getting into the text, uh, I feel like I've been on a really good streak of being able to preach a real practical message of being able to talk about the church and then really bring it down in practical terms. And so I wrestled with this particular text because it's really high theologically and I tend to be a teacher. And so I wanna kind of stay there, but I also need to bring it down so that we could really kind of uh, eat it together so that it can be edible for us. And so uh, uh, just know that I was just wrestling through this text the entire week to really kind of take it out of the clouds and bring it here on earth. And so just bear with me uh, as I bear with you as we kind of walk through and what I wanna say wrestle through some theology of the text, is that okay? Okay, just a, a PSA for everyone here. And so if you have your Bibles, will you open up to Ephesians chapter 2? And we are going to read verses 11 through 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 uh, through 19. We'll also have it for you here on the screen momentarily. But if you do have your Bibles or your Bible apps, I would love to invite you to open with me there. Now, I want you to kind of hold that place for a moment because I want to set the table. Uh, I want to 
break down the cultural context, like what's going on around this letter so that when we read this letter, we can jump into it and kind of have an understanding of what the Apostle Paul was trying to say in that time at that place, okay? So I'm going to set the table and then we are going to get into the text. Is that okay? So hold your place. Paul, the Apostle, writes letters to churches. And Paul, in this book of Ephesians, writes a letter to churches that are in Ephesus. Now, what's really important for us to know about the churches that are in Ephesus is that these churches are all filled with Gentile converts to Christ. What do I mean by that? Gentiles were non-Jews. The Jews considered everybody who were not ethnically Jew Gentiles. And so this church happened to be full of non-Jewish followers of Jesus. Are you with me? And, and this actually posed a real threat to the intimacy of the church because the church started with an all, as an all-Jewish movement. All Jews were converted. The church started in Jerusalem and the book of Acts began to go outward. And so why was this such a threat? I'm going to tell you why. Because the Jews despise the Gentiles. The Jews despise. In fact, the Jews had put up walls. The Jews were prejudiced. The Jews despised their ethnicity because they were not considered the chosen people of God. In fact, the Jews took pride in the fact that God had revealed to them his law. And God's law was good, but God's law created a fence around the Jews so that they wouldn't mix with the idolatry of the Gentiles. Are you with me? But, and even though that fence was good, the Jews used it to puff themselves up in religion and pride to keep people out. And so they despised the Gentiles. And so when the early church started to see Gentile converts, this supposedly beautiful community started to get ugly. How many of you know the minute you add another person in the room, it gets ugly? Amen. So Paul writes this letter to reveal to this Gentile church a mystery that God has kept hidden. In fact, Paul says, there's something that God has been keeping away, secret, until right now. And I'm going to reveal that to you. And what was the secret, the mystery that God had kept hidden? Are you ready for this? The mystery was this, that in Christ Jesus, all nations have been united to God and to one another in one body. Are you with me? That in Jesus, in Christ, not just the Jews, but all nations, all ethnicities, all colors, all races in Christ have been united back to God and to one another in one body called the church. Yet, and this is really important, while some Jews still labored to exclude the Gentiles because of their blood, Paul writes that you are included because of the blood. And so while some labor to exclude Gentiles because of their blood, Paul says, on the contrary, you are included because of the blood. Amen. So he says this in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11 through 19. Therefore. Now, again, I got to stop there because a good student of the scriptures, whenever they read the word therefore, they have to ask, what is it there for? You see, a therefore means Paul said something before. 
And whatever he said before will then lead into what he's about to say now. And so whenever you see a therefore, he's about to say, look, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't understand this until you first keep this in mind. So therefore, so I got to go back really quick. He says, therefore, the apostle Paul says, remember the gospel of Jesus Christ, like a good gospel centered preacher earlier in verse two, he says, remember when you you were dead in your trespasses. You were a sinner. You were an enemy of God. But he says in verse four, but God being rich in mercy, God being great with love, even when we were dead, we were made alive in Christ. That's the gospel. And he says, with that beautiful understanding of how Jesus made you and I alive when we were dead in sin. Listen, unearned, undeserved. There's nothing that you did, nothing that you could do to earn your space with God, but Christ earned it on your behalf. Paul says, man, y'all are getting over there. Thank you. I hear y'all. Shout me down today. He says, listen, when you understand all that Christ has done, he says, therefore, now listen to this. Are you with me? So scripture says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. You know, that was derogatory, side note, just so you know. Like, I, I, I don't know if you remember the story of David and Goliath. David calls Goliath, you uncircumcised Philistine, right? Like that was a derogatory turn. That was like calling him a punk and maybe some other four letter words. It'd be like that sometimes. Paul says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Here it is. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he, that's Jesus, are you ready, might create in himself one new man in place of the two. In other words, in Jesus' death, he took Jews and Gentiles who were separated and he brought brought them together and created one new man. He says he created himself one new man in the place of two. So making peace and might, ready, reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came, that's Jesus, and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers, or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. It's a lot. You can see how I wrestled through the text, but I'm going to tell you, that text is so heavy and so powerful. We could probably end right now, and many of us would be able to walk out of here feeling like Jesus spoke, and he did through his word. But here's what I want to tell you. Paul describes the Jews as those who were close. 
He says those who are close and those who are far. Now, the reason why he says the Jews were close is because they were given the word of God. Like Abraham was called out by God. And then Abraham had a family. And then that family became a tribe. And then that tribe became a nation of Israel. And then from Israel came Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so they were considered God's chosen people. And so Paul says, those of you who were near, those of you who had the word of God, that were chosen by and then those of you who were far, all the other nations, that's us, all the other Gentiles, who had nothing to do with the word of God, who were ignorant and knew nothing about God's plan. He says, both of you were brought near. Are you with me? I wanted to tell you this, because the Jew and the Gentile, one is far and one is near, doesn't disregard this truth, that the fundamental condition of all humanity, this is important, the fundamental condition of all humanity remains the same, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And so I'm gonna sum up my message in one sentence, and then I promise we're gonna jump into this and fire away. Here's the sentence. Because the fundamental condition of all mankind is alienation. All mankind is alienated. The primary purpose of Christ's work is reconciliation. Because man is fundamentally disconnected. The primary work of Christ was to come and reconnect mankind. Are you with me? And so how did he do that? We were bonded by his blood. Bonded by his blood. And so let's, let's move forward. The fundamental condition of all of mankind is alienation. And, and you don't have to look at the, the Gentile or the Jew. You can even go back to Adam when both Gentile and Jew were in one man. You know, we all came from Adam. All humanity is descended from Adam. And so let's go back before there was race and ethnicity. Let's go all the way back when we were all in one body, Adam. Adam sinned, and as a result of his sin, if you remember, he was kicked out. He was exiled out of the garden. His sin separated him, alienated him, removed him, pushed him out from the presence of a holy God. Are you with me? And so Paul tells these Gentile churches to remember. He says, remember what it looked like. Remember who you were. Remember how you were. Remember where you were before you met Jesus. Paul says, and if you forgot, let me describe to you what that looked like and help remember, help you jog your memory. He says this, you were separated. You were distant. You were isolated. You were excluded. You were empty. You were hopeless. You were godless. Paul tells him you had no higher purpose. You had no greater meaning. Paul tells him you had no real hope beyond the grave and because you had no hope beyond the grave this life was all that you had when you are not in Christ there's no hope beyond the grave which means this world is your heaven that's terrible especially if you fell on your bike they're they're their Facebook status would have read alienated, cut off from God, cut off from God's people. And what I want to do here is I want to pause and I want to gift to you a, a really, I think is an important principle. I want, to, I want to gift to you the principle of remembrance. I want to gift to you this principle. What do I mean by that? I want you to think for those of you in here, we're followers of Christ. And if you're not, this is just a great chance just to tune in and listen and hear uh, who we are and what we believe. But for those of you who are in Christ, take a minute and do this. Remember who you were before you met Jesus. Part of the problem for some of us is we can't. But just remember, remember, remember who you were before you met Jesus. And some of you might be thinking, like, why in the world would I want to do that? <laughs> right? Like, like I, I've put that in my past. I don't want anyone to know it. I don't want him to see it. Some of y'all, we just scrolled through your Instagram about six months ago or a year, a couple of years, and we get to remember. Thank God and, and, and thank, you know, your generation. I love y'all, but thank God. 
I didn't have all my photos out there because my goodness, and so y'all do a really good job. But I'm just saying, some of y'all don't have to go too far to remember who you were and what you were before you met Jesus. But you might be thinking, why, Pastor Phil, would you want to encourage me to remember my past? I mean, doesn't the scripture say that God takes our sin and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember it anymore? Yes, God does that. And it's beautiful that our God forgives but I want to tell you there is a valid reason as to why God would call you in a healthy way to remember who you were before you met Jesus and so I'm going to give you two reasons why it is worth you sitting down this week and recalling where you were who you were how you were before you met Jesus number one are you ready remembering where you used to be encourages you and inspires worship I uh, I often talk to Christians who are frustrated with where they're at you ever had that feeling you ever been angry with yourself or frustrated with where you're at as if God isn't working and, 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 and I kind of laugh, and I don't laugh in their face, but in my mind, I kind of giggle. It's ironic because people expect God to undo in one or two years what sin and Satan has tried to destroy in like 10, 15, and 20 years. Like, I mean, have you ever ran to, like, people want God to move and to undo what years of hurt, what years of abuse, what years of sin, what years of Satan has come against you and say, God, how come you haven't done all this? And they want to see in a year what 10, 15, 20, 30 years have done. And it frustrates them. But I'm always there to remind them that God is a God of process. Amen? He's a God of process. And that, like many of us in here, maybe not all of us, but God prefers slow-cooked disciples, not fast food disciples. And God prefers his food slowly cooked, not fastly made. And so although I admire your hunger to change, I really do, I'm here to remind you that even though you may not be where you think you should be, you are a lot further than you used to be. And if there's any pastors or mentors or leaders in this place, you know you want to spray it on people like, wait a minute, you're not the same person. Your appetites have changed. Yes, you may fall. Yes, you may fail, but what you used to love, you no longer love. And the very reason that you're frustrated suggests that the thing that you used to enjoy, you now disdain. Your appetites are changing. Your appetites are changing. You're getting an acquired taste. A little bit. Listen, and I think this is really some, for somebody today. Um, we can either grumble about how far we still need to go or we can worship God for how far he's brought us. You're here. You made it. Barely made it. <laughs> Barely holding on. But you're here. In fact, I want to tell you, you're not holding on. In fact, if it was in your own power, you wouldn't even be here. The fact that you're here is because Christ is holding on to you. I don't want to pretend like we're the faithful ones. And so we're either going to grumble with how far we need to go or we can worship. Amen. With how far God has brought us. Second reason why I think it's important to remember. You know what remembering does? It humbles you. And it inspires gospel hospitality. Hmm. What is that? 
You see, when I remember how distant I was, when I recall how disconnected I was, when I remember what it felt like to be dead inside, when I remember what it felt like to have no God, no hope, no meaning beyond the grave, when I remember what it felt like to be all alone, here's what begins to happen. The Spirit of God begins to stir inside of me. And all of a sudden, I am compelled Held to love those who are in the place that I used to be. I'm compelled to love the lost, welcome the sinner, open the doors wide to my church, open the doors wide to my home, open the doors wide to the clique that I have in church that's closed up and doesn't allow anybody in. But when I remember what it felt like to walk through these doors, rejected, alienated, distant when I begin to remember how it feels all of a sudden my doors open and I invite and I bring lost sheep into the fold some of the most ungrateful and spiritually stingy folks in the church are those who fail to remember or they think they got nothing to remember because they've just always been in. I've always been, right? Us born and raised in church, right? It's the born and raised people in church. We got problems. We got problems because we think we're good. Right, and that's who the Jews were. It was the people who were born and raised. They were given the, the golden, you know, the, the red carpet. That, it was, and it was difficult for them. You know what happens? After the Jews rejected, God said, I'm going to go to the street. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to the people. And those of you in my youth ministry, you know this. It was always the kids who were born and raised in church that had been there before, heard it, done it. And it was always the kids that were coming in off the street, broken, seeing some things. It was easier to stir them to passion. Are you with me? I used to say, you know what happens when your youth group gets stale? You go to the streets. Are you with me? Some of the most ungrateful and spiritually stingy folks in the church are those who fail to remember who they were before they met Jesus. You see, before Christ, we were strangers, foreigners, and orphans looking for belonging. But in Christ, amen, strangers are turned into friends, foreigners are made citizens, and orphans are placed into homes. Orphans are placed into families. And you know how? By the blood. We are bonded by the blood of Jesus. And so if our fundamental status as mankind is alienation, then Jesus' primary work is reconciliation. He reunites what has been disconnected. And so I love Paul. Paul doesn't just leave them there, right? It'd be really messed up. Remember how bad you were. All right. You know, praise God. Like, wow, that's not great, Paul. Like, I, you got to take me somewhere. Like, don't keep me lost in that space. Like, I don't want to wander in these memories and soak them up. And then I'm like, well, I'm going to go back there. Right? And so Paul says, look, re remember, he says, but now. If you remember the text, he says, remember, but then he says, but now, which means he takes them from their past. Remember your past, but now recall where you are now. Look at where you've been, but sit in where Christ has you now, the present. Paul tells him a radical shift was made. Something drastic happened. Your status was updated. It went from alienated to reconciled. What opened their eyes? What gave them hope? What brought them close when they were so far? Paul tells them it was nothing but 
the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. Hmm. We may not all look the same, but in Christ, we have been bonded by the blood. We may not all talk the same, but in Christ, we have been bonded in the blood. We may not be the same skin tone, but in Christ, we have been bonded in the blood. We may not all vote the same. Some of y'all voted for Larry Elder and some of y'all voted for Gavin Newsom, but we have been bonded in the blood. We may not all be vaccinated, but we all have been bonded in the blood. All precious is the blood. Listen, while a good community is built upon the memories we make, the friendships we create, and the interests we share, the beautiful community is built on the blood that was shed. You know what that tells me? That tells me that in the church, I can have more in common with somebody in the world that I have nothing in common with. It's really weird how when you get in Christ, there are people you would have never connected with in the world, but all of a sudden you're bonded in the blood. People say blood is thicker than water. And they say that so that you would remember how important family is. But can I tell you something? Blood is thicker than blood. The blood of Christ is thicker than the blood of your family. And I'm not a cult. This isn't a cult. I'm not asking you to leave your family. Love your family. They're important. But when everything's said and done and you spend eternity, you'll spend eternity with those who've been bonded by the blood. Hmm. Wow. The beautiful community. I want to give you three truths about the beautiful community, and you guys are doing great. And we'll get ready to land the plane. Don't get too excited for a preacher. That's about another hour. Just kidding. I won't keep you here that long. But nonetheless, we're going we're gonna to slowly land this plane. Trust me. Three truths about the beautiful community. Here they are. I'm going to give them to you up front so you can be ready and prepared, and then we'll just blast off. Number one, the beautiful community is the result of Christ's suffering. Number two, the beautiful community is the reward of Christ's suffering. And number three, the beautiful community is the revelation of Christ's resurrection. The reward of his suffering, the reason for his suffering, the result of his suffering, and it is the revelation of his resurrection. Amen? Let's dive in. Number one, the beautiful community is the result of Christ's suffering. You know what a result is? A result is the end outcome of something, right? And so something is being produced and there's a whole way that it's produced, but at the end, that production or assembly line produces a result, an end outcome. And so the beautiful community called the church is the result of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to know this. Peace doesn't come naturally to humans. Do you know that? Like peace doesn't come natural to sinners. In fact, what comes more natural by our flesh is not peace, but hostility. Let me see if I can break this down to you. Peace doesn't come naturally to sinners, but what does come natural to sinners are invisible walls of hostility. I'll prove it to you. We see this among the nations, don't we? Invisible lines called borders designed to keep people out. Dividing lines that we are so committed to protecting that we will even send our sons and daughters to shed their blood for. You see, we're really 
not good at peace, but we are really good at creating invisible walls of hostility. Now, there are reasons for just war and there are reasons for borders. I'm not suggesting we tear it all down. What I am suggesting is that because we are sinners and other are sinners, we create borders and boundaries to protect ourselves from hostility. We see it in the nations, invisible walls of hostility. Maybe let's bring this down. We see it in our homes. <laughs> brothers and brothers. Brothers and sisters, mother, son, father, son, walls of hostility, husbands and wives. Right, for those of you in here that work with marriages, husbands and wives accumulating years of bitterness like bricks. Years of bitterness, years of resentment toward one another. And what do they do with those bricks? They build up walls. And those walls are designed to keep intimacy out. But here in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul actually talks about the wall of hostility as something a little different. He says it's the law of God. Now, he's not saying that the law is bad, but he's saying the law actually produces hostility. You see, it's the law of God, are you ready? It, that exposes the invisible hostility. It's God's law that awakens you to the reality of something that you wouldn't know unless God put his law there. So the law reveals that you have a wall that you can't see, and that wall is on two fronts. Are you ready? Two fronts. Here it is. And again, bear with me. I'm just trying to break this down, but I promise we're coming to a landing. Two fronts. Two fronts. Number one, are you ready? The law exposes your hostility with God. Did you know that apart from Christ, you're at war with God? Did you know that? Did you know that apart from Christ, we are at war with God? This is going to be controversial. I'm going to say something that's really controversial. Did you know that not everyone is a child of God? Now, in one sense, we were all created by God as creator, and so we are a product of God. But did you know that not everyone is a child of God? In fact, in our culture, there's a kind of cultural Christianity that says we're all God's children. What do you mean by that? <laughs> About to kick me out of here. Listen to how Paul describes us before we met Jesus. He says, you were sons of disobedience. And he says, and you were by nature children of wrath. That doesn't sound like a son of God. Paul says, you lived in the passion of your flesh. You carried out the desires of your body and your mind. Whatever the word said, you didn't do. And so although you may be in here even today thinking that you're a friend of God, you're actually an enemy of God. Why would I be an enemy of God? Because you love your sin and hate the word. Because if you loved the word and hated your sin, you would submit to Christ in obedience to his word. And so all of us, by nature, we do not submit to the word, but we love our sin. And as a result, it has made us an enemy of God. How could you call him a friend if you despise everything he says? I mean, would that make a good friend to you? If somebody said, I love you, you are my friend, and they break every promise, they second guess everything you say, they don't show up, but you're my friend. We were not God friends. We were his enemies. So Christ came and shed his blood. Amen. And what you see on the cross is gruesome. I mean, what kind of, we got a bloody religion, y'all. It's bloody, it's nasty, it's gruesome. Jesus on the cross, blood splattered, torture, torment. We even wear it around our neck and think it's cute. And it is a little cute. Some of y'all got some cute ones. 
But nonetheless, it's not a cute religion. It's ugly. And you, if you were there, you wouldn't look. You would have to turn away. But what do we see on that cross? That, what is that gruesome? What is taking place on the cross? As Jesus was being slaughtered and brutalized, what you're seeing is the wrath of God being soaked up on your behalf. That's what we see on the cross. The wrath of God that has been reserved for sinners, Jesus has soaked up upon himself so that anybody who would just believe See what I said? Believe. I didn't say do any works. I didn't say stop doing this. You got to stop smoking, stop drinking. You got to stop doing this. I didn't say all that. I said anybody who would just look at that cross and say, you know what? I'm a sinner. And I believe that on that cross, when you were being brutalized, you were taking all of God's wrath on my behalf. And so what was Jesus doing on that cross? You ready? He was removing the invisible wall of hostility that existed between you and God. Y'all see that? That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And Paul says this, because of Christ's blood, Jesus made both Jew and Gentile one new man. And he reconciled them both to God in one body. In Christ, cultural hostility is gone. In Christ, prejudice and preferential treatment is gone. In Christ, old divisions and wrongful attitudes of superiority or inferiority are gone. Racism is gone in Christ. Toxic masculinity is gone in Christ. Radical femininity is gone in Christ. Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ. Paul wasn't saying there's no distinctions. He was saying in the Bible, Body, there's diversity, but in that diversity, you've been bonded by the blood. So the question becomes, why would we ever want to be a part of anything that would separate what Christ died to unite? This brings us to our second point, the beautiful community is the reward of Christ's suffering. Amen? Why would I want to do anything to jeopardize the unity that Christ died for? What what right do I have to stay offended, y'all? What right do I have to withhold forgiveness? What right do I have to hold on to bitterness, to carry grudges? Why would I want to reinforce hostile walls that Christ bled? To bring down. And how could I not look at the church and find it beautiful? How could I not look at the church and find it beautiful if Jesus bled to unite it? How could I not fall in love with the body? Yeah, it's not perfect. And yeah, it can wound and it can hurt and sinners are in the pews. But how could I look at what Christ died for and call it ugly? Finally, the team can come up as we get ready to finish. The beautiful community is the revelation of Christ's resurrection. Amen? What do I mean by that? I mean that the existence of the church is evidence that Jesus is reigning on the throne. When the world looks at the church, the church is supposed to reveal Christ, so that when the world sees the church not looking like the world mm, and dividing, not allowing partisan to come into the congregation, when the world looks at the church and sees that the church loves one another because they're bonded in the blood beyond preferences, when the world sees that, it is evidence 
that Jesus is on the throne, that Christ is reigning, and that he is reigning over his church. Bonded. Bonded by the blood. What a, what a word that I feel like sometimes the American church needs to hear. Bonded by the blood. Bonded by the blood. I want to finish as we get ready just to sing and dismiss. I want to finish. This week I was thinking about this message and it was tough for me to really navigate it through and bring it to this place and thank God for his grace. But I was thinking about a couple of things were rolling through my head. I'll take a long walk in the evening and just process through. But there's one phrase that stood out to me. Uh, um, I think it was a song. <laughs> uh, so I think this is why it stood out to me. Those of us who kind of grew up in church, there's kind of these old songs you remember. And, but nonetheless, this phrase just continued to kind of reverberate in my heart. And, and, and it's found, I believe it's in verse 13 or verse 14, where the Apostle Paul says, uh, uh, referring to Jesus, for he himself is our peace. Do you remember that song? Uh, for some of you, maybe. Uh, he, he is our peace that has broken down every wall. He is our peace. He is our peace. Right? And Paul says, for he himself is our peace. Which is really interesting because Jesus didn't come just to give peace. He didn't come just to make peace. But he is peace. Which means that if I don't have Jesus, I don't have the embodiment of peace. He didn't just make it. He didn't just create it, but he is peace. And I was just thinking through that. And I began to ask myself this question. How did peace kill hostility? It's really weird, right? Kind of counterintuitive. Did you know peace declared war? Isn't that counterintuitive? I mean, I mean, peace and war, like those are opposites. Like peace doesn't wage war. But I thought about it. Paul is describing peace as waging war against hostility. So then I begin to think to myself, what kind of weapons did peace use? I mean, we live in a world where we have to use weapons, right? We, we have just wars to protect. And so we fight others to, to stop the enhancement of what we consider to be evil or, or, or destructive uh, uh, nations or dictators. I mean, we do these things and we use these weapons. But in this text, what's fascinating is that when peace went to war, the weapon of the warfare of peace was that peace gave his life up. Gosh, how upside down are we? Do you see that? The most violent thing that could have happened to hostility was that somebody would lay down his life. Hmm. Huh. I wonder if the church got a revelation of that. How much that would change the way we would forgive one another. I wonder if Married couples got a revelation of the laying down of your life to tear down invisible walls. I wonder, I wonder how much better our marriages would be. Hmm. Jesus, what a beautiful savior who fights wars and uses weapons that we could never imagine using ourselves. And yet that's why he alone is the one who removed the wall of hostility because he laid down his life. Why is this community beautiful? It's not because y'all look good on Sundays, take a long time to do your hair. It's not because, oh, we don't argue or we don't fight because we do that. And oftentimes we, we reinforce walls through arguments and even by force physically. But this church is beautiful because Christ made you beautiful when he laid down his life to remove the walls of hostility. And so with that truth in mind, can we just respond and sing to the Lord and then we'll pray and dismiss together.